holy in the early 20th century. And it had a hard time gaining popularity. While the beginning of Mother's Day was met with great excitement and became an official national holiday relatively quickly, the same cannot be said for Father's Day. Interestingly, Father's Day was met with fierce opposition early on. Not sure why, but it was. The first celebration of it, as best can be determined, happened in 1910 in Spokane, Washington. But it was not recognized as a national holiday until President Richard Nixon signed it into law in 1972, some 58 years after Mother's Day had been so recognized. I know a lot of us uh, have our daddies on our mind today, and I want to take advantage of that, like we did just a few weeks ago on Mother's Day, and bring the Word of God into our thoughts on fatherhood. As we stated on Mother's Day, the same is true for today. Our purpose for gathering today is to honor and glorify our Heavenly Father and our Savior. But in the process of doing that, one of the things that that God has ordained in our worship is to take some time to reflect on His Word. And His Word does have much to say about fatherhood. And so I want to take advantage of that today and spend a few minutes reflecting on and looking at this unnamed father in John chapter 4. And we'll do that in two stages. First of all, we'll just kind of rehearse the story. We'll look at what happened in John chapter 4 involving this, this father. And then after that, we'll draw some lessons, just three of them today for our consideration. All right, so let's, let's look at John 4 and just get our minds kind of focused on here's what happened. The early part of the chapter tells us that Jesus had been in Jerusalem. He was there for Passover, and with that, uh, that feast celebration having been finished, he is headed back to Galilee. Now, you have to picture that in your minds. Uh, I don't know if everybody is like this. Uh, I am, therefore you ought to be. Uh, no, I'm just joking, <clears throat> Mary, I'm just joking, because I do this with her. I think in maps when I think about locations. When, when I think about locations, I see a map in my mind. I don't know if you do that, but you might uh, picture that in your mind if you, if you, um, if you have a, a, a map in, your, in the recesses of your brain that you can pull up of the promised land. If not, you can look in the back of your Bible. There are some handy ones there. Promised land kind of divided in the days of Jesus into three sections. The north, Galilee, in the middle, Samaria, in the, in the south, Judea. Jerusalem was in the south, in Judea. Jesus had been there to observe that Passover celebration. Well, now he's headed back to the north, to Galilee. He goes through Samaria. And while he was in Samaria, he was pretty well received. It was then that he, that he met... Uh, a particular woman at uh, the side uh, or the location of Jacob's well, and he had a conversation with her, and she went into the, the, the town and told the people that the Messiah was there, and crowds of people came out to where Jesus was, and they received him very well. And he leaves there and continues his trek to the north, and he enters into the northern section of Galilee, and he comes to the small town of Cana where he had been previously, John chapter 2. He also received a pretty warm welcome when he arrived back in Galilee. Verse 45 of John 4 tells us that. Now, when he arrives in in Galilee and he goes to Cana, word word is spread. This is at a time in in, uh, the ministry of Jesus in which his popularity is pretty high. 
among the people. And so word is spreading that Jesus is in the area. And word reaches the city of Capernaum, where a nobleman, as he is uh, called in some of the older translations, hears that Jesus is there. John 4, verse 47. And he goes to find Jesus. Now, this nobleman, that, that word simply refers to a palace official. Some translations even use uh, that, that language. It, it was a man that was a part of the royal or a royal household. This was a king's officer. Now, what king? Well, the text doesn't tell us for certain, but I think there's enough evidence for us to take a pretty good educated uh, guess at it without uh, doing any damage to the text. We know historically that Herod Antipas, who was the ruler put, put there by the Romans, the ruler of Galilee, well, Antipas had a palace in Capernaum from which this nobleman had come. It's probably no stretch of the imagination to assume that this man would have come from Herod's place, from Herod's palace. And he comes to Jesus, <clears throat> comes to Cana to find Jesus, but this man is not on official business. He's not there representing Herod Antipas. He is there because he's a father. And he has a son. And the son has been sick for some length of time. And now John tells us that the son was near death. And so the reputation of Jesus had been growing and growing so much that this officer in the palace of Herod Antipas had heard of this man. And had heard of the things that he had done and could do. And he wanted help, healing, for his sick son. Now, as, as I understand those who have a better grasp of the Greek text than I, than I do, I read that... The, that the import of the, the construction of this text that says, tells us what the man did in verse 47 was that the man left at once, he came to Jesus and kept imploring him. He kept begging him to come to Capernaum and heal his son. So again, you can probably picture it in your mind. This palace official hears word that Jesus is near their area. And so he, he heads off and he finds where Jesus is. And he comes to him and he, he continues over and over again to beg Jesus, come back with me, come to Capernaum, please, and heal my son. But then the response comes in verse 48. And we see that response and and. It just seems a bit terse, doesn't it? This distraught and desperate father has come to Jesus for help. He has a son who's near death. He begs Jesus to come and the response from the Lord is this. Unless you see signs and wonders... You will not believe. Now, two things. Well, maybe a little more than two, but we'll start with two. First of all, John says Jesus said these words to him. He addressed those words to the Father. Second thing, however, is that when Jesus says, unless you see signs, why will you? Now, in English, you can be both singular or plural. In other words, I could speak to you, Lee, singularly. Or I could speak to you, 
all of you collectively and use the same second person pronoun. Context would have to determine if I was speaking to a singular person or to a group. Greek's not like that. You had different words that you can see, that you can tell just by looking at the word. Is this you singular or you plural? Verse 48, it's you plural. He says these words to the Father, but they are intended to be applied to the group. Unless, and if you'll allow me to use the southern expression, unless y'all see signs and wonders, you will not believe. So when Jesus addresses the man, he's actually saying something that he's intending to apply to all of the people that are gathered there that day. Jesus wanted to be recognized and known as more than just a miracle worker. And that wasn't because of any kind of ego on his part. It was a part of his mission. The things that he did, the miracles that he did, were intended to point to something greater than the miracles themselves. They were intended to point to his identity, that he was indeed God in the flesh, Matthew 1, 21 to 23. And and people needed to make that connection, that if Jesus had the ability, the power to do these miraculous things like instantaneously heal people, raise the dead, calm the storms, all of those things, that if all of those things were true, what does it say about him as to who he is? And then, what should I do about that? If, if If the only person that could ever accomplish these things is God... And Jesus is accomplishing these things, therefore indicating that he is God among us. Should I not listen to what he says? Should I not be interested in in following him and in submitting myself to him because he is my, my God, my creator, the one to whom I answer? But oftentimes it was the case that people wanted the miracle but they didn't want the person. Jesus would say to some, just a couple of chapters later in John chapter 6, this is right after he had fed the the, the 5,000 plus people with the little boy's lunch. And after that great miracle, people were following him. They they were searching him out. Even when he was trying to, to get some rest by himself, they came and they found him. And Jesus made this statement. John 6, verses 26 and 27. He said, you seek me, Not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Don't work for the food that perishes, but work for that food that endures unto eternal life. His point was, you didn't seek me out because of the sign indicating. You didn't seek me out because of what those miracles were pointing you to. That's what a sign does. It points you to a greater reality. You go to Niagara Falls, you see a lot of signs, but people don't hover around the signs. What do they do? The signs point them to the reality, and they go to the reality. The miracles of Jesus were intended to do that, but a lot of people weren't focused on the reality. They were too enamored by the sign. And so Jesus was making a statement about the general feeling of of the populace. And he wanted to be more to them, needed to be more to them than just a miracle worker. And I would add this too about the Lord's statement in verse 48. Remember, Jesus knows what he's about to do. And so even though he makes this statement to try to to alert the people to think more about the signs that he's doing and and what they mean, Jesus knows what he's about to do. The young the young boy was not in any more danger by by the Lord's off-handed statement than he would have been otherwise. But back to the Father. 
while the statement of Jesus was true, this father did not have the time for theological discussions. He was dealing with a matter of life and death. And so he doesn't acknowledge what Jesus said. He just simply begs him again to spring to action. Verse 49. Come down before my child dies. And so then Jesus, in verse number 50, with just a single statement, healed the son. But in the process of healing the son, he tells the father, go your way. Your son lives. Well, the fever left the boy. And when it did, a group of servants set out to find this royal official, their master, and deliver the good news. And when the, the father discovered that the fever had left at exactly the same time that Jesus pronounced him well, the text says that he and his household believed. That's verses 52 and 53. And so from a, from a, a state of desperation comes celebration and faith. So that's what happened. Now what are, what are some lessons that we can draw from this that specifically have some application to fathers? Let me offer you these three for your consideration. First of all this, status will not exempt your family from difficulties. Status will not exempt your family from difficulties. This father was part of the royal household. He had status. He was an officer in Herod's palace. He had servants under him, right? Because the servants would come to tell him the good news once the boy had been healed. Kind of gives you an idea of where this man stood. And yet, trouble still found its way under his roof. See, we live in a culture that is conditioned to think that obtaining material wealth and social status will bring an easy life. That's, that's the message that we hear regularly. And sometimes it's shouted in just so many words, but most of the time it's, it's, the, it's the subtle message that we get in living in such a prosperous nation as we do. That we're conditioned to think that if, if I just have enough money, then my problems would be gone. And with that as an underlying mentality, a lot of fathers work hard to provide all of the latest gadgets and gizmos, thinking that those are the things that will best serve my family. You know, Jesus once referred to something that he called the deceitfulness of riches. Matthew chapter 13, verse 22, in his explanation of the parable of the sower, that one of the things, <clears throat> you know, just like weeds can choke out a plant that's trying to grow, that some of the weeds that can choke out the influence of the Word of God in our lives and hearts are the, is the deceitfulness of riches, the deceitfulness of, of wealth. You see, wealth promises so much more than it can ever deliver. That's the deceitfulness of riches. Whoever trusts in his riches will fall. Proverbs 11, verse 28. Paul said in 1 Timothy 6, verse 17, to Timothy command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty nor to trust in uncertain riches but in the living God who gives us all things to enjoy money is a great servant but it is a terrible master and when we get those things mixed up we set ourselves up for problems now there is not anything wrong with status and wealth as such Nothing sinful about those things. God is able 
to distribute those gifts as he sees fit. And he does. But there is often a strong temptation to think that those gifts that come from God will solve all of our problems. And that's why Paul told Timothy, you instruct those that are wealthy not to trust in uncertain riches, but to trust in God, the giver of them. Never ascribe to the created thing the traits that only the Creator has. And so I I don't know what this man thought, going back to John 4 and this palace official, this nobleman. I I don't know if he trusted in his status or not. That's not my point. My point is the temptation is there to allow status and material wealth and all of that to, to affect our thinking in a negative way. And just because a person has wealth or status, that will not exempt a person from difficulties. And this father teaches us that. How about this lesson in the second place? Jesus can bring healing to your family. Fathers, if your family needs healing, Jesus can bring that to your family. Just like Jesus brought health to this officer's son, he can bring health to our families too. And I think specifically, by way of application, on the spiritual diseases that often plague our families. Perhaps a dwindling respect for parents, domestic violence, the relaxing of moral standards in dress, language, media, I think of the disease of materialism. How about the terrible effects of divorce, verbal abuse, alcohol and other drugs, pornography and sexual sin, absentee parents, I mean the list tragically is long. But those are the kinds of of diseases, if you will, that, that can enter into our homes and our families. What's the answer for all of that? Jesus. Jesus can heal all of those diseases. But that leads us to the third point that builds on the second point, and that's this. If we would be healed by Jesus, we must trust Jesus. Fathers, hear me well. If if Jesus is going to bring health to our families, we have to trust him to do that. We have to trust his plan for how that's going to be accomplished. Now think about our father here, uh, our example father in John chapter 4, this nobleman. He had some degree of trust in Jesus at the beginning because he came to Jesus, right? He had heard what Jesus could do, and then he heard Jesus was there, and so he searches him out. There was some level of trust there already, but that trust then had to survive a test, a test of strength. How strong was this man's trust? When the man begged Jesus in verse 49, "Come, please, please come and heal my son, the response of Jesus was, go, your son lives. When Jesus said that, this man had a choice to make. Did he trust Jesus or not? Remember, what, what was on his mind about what Jesus would have to do? It's there in the language. The man comes and says to Jesus, Come with me. Come down and heal my son. What was on his mind? Jesus would need to be physically present to accomplish this healing. Please, come with me. Come with me. Jesus just simply said, Your son lives. Go on back home. How strong was his faith? 
How strong was his faith in what Jesus was instructing him to do? Did he really trust that Jesus had the power to heal his son? That was the test that he had to pass. He passed it. Because the Bible says he turned around and left. Believing that what Jesus had said had happened. That took a lot of trust, didn't it? If in your mind you've, you've convinced yourself that you need to bring this man with you and he tells you to go, are you going to be able to do, are you going to be willing to do that? You have his attention now. He's listening to you. And now he's telling you to go away. If we want a spiritually healthy family, we have to trust the physician's advice. That's Proverbs 3, verses 5 and following. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He'll direct your path. Too many times we trust too much in our own understanding. We hear this phrase a lot in a lot of different contexts. How many times do you hear somebody say, I got this? I got this. Well, too many times we think we got this, and we're not even close. Trust in the Lord. Trust in His prescription for healthy families. And even when the results of that trust may not be immediately apparent, that was the case with this nobleman, wasn't it? He asked Jesus for help. Jesus gave him verbal assurance that the help had been given, but he hadn't seen it. He didn't know until the servants came and told him that the healing had actually taken place. So the results were not immediately apparent to him, but he trusted anyway. That's for us, fathers. Trust God's way of doing things even if and when the results may not be immediately apparent. If you pray for your family, and, and, and it has to, you know, and I'm not, you, you fill in the specifics of what the prayer is. And yet, Change is not immediately apparent. What do you do? Well, you keep praying. You trust God and you trust His process. I think about Abraham in that respect. Romans chapter 4, verses 20 and 21, as Paul's talking about how Abraham responded to God's promise that he was going to bless all nations through his seed. We talked a little bit about that in class this morning, but not this point from that text. If that was going to happen, Abraham was going to have to have a, a, a child, which he didn't have. But God told him he would, that Sarah would bear him a son that would begin to create this lineage through which ultimately the promised seed would come. And Abraham had to wait a long time for that promise to be fulfilled. So what happened in the intervening years between the time that God promised Abraham that it would happen and the time that it actually happened? Paul tells us in Romans 4, 20 and 21 that Abraham did not waver through unbelief, but he grew strong in faith, being fully assured that what God had promised he was able to accomplish. I think sometimes we have the exact opposite response. That from the time we turn something over to God in prayer, that the longer it takes for that to be fulfilled, the weaker our faith gets. Doesn't that seem to be the case with a lot of us? I, maybe I'm saying more about myself than I am anybody else. It's certainly true for me that the longer it takes for the, for the, 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 the answer to be given, the weaker my faith gets. With Abraham, it was different. He grew strong in faith during those intervening waiting years. He grew stronger in faith, giving glory to God.
How did that happen? Because Abraham focused not on his circumstances, but on his God. Yes, the text says, he considered his own age and he considered the barrenness of Sarah. So he wasn't blind to his circumstances. He didn't deny the circumstances. But his focus was more on the fact that what God had promised, God was able to perform. And because that was the main focus of his mind, he grew in faith, giving glory to God through all of those intervening years of waiting. He trusted in the God who made the promise. Fathers, and any of us for that matter, if we want the healing in our families, if we want the healing in our lives, we have to trust the God who makes the promises. And we have to trust the process given us by the God who makes the promises. That's a great lesson, I think, from this nobleman. He trusted. When Jesus said, go, he went. Fathers, we have challenging and sobering responsibilities as fathers to bring up our children in the training and admonition of the Lord, Ephesians 6, 4. And this palace official, I think, teaches us some important lessons about that that status and wealth is not going to exempt our families from difficulties. But Jesus can heal our families if we trust in Him and in His Word. Our children need us, fathers. Regardless of their ages, they need us. They need our direction, our support, our correction, our time, and our love. Let us give all of those things to them. Pray with me. Gracious Father, we thank you for the example that we have looked at today for just a few minutes from John 4. We pray that the lessons will not be lost on us, but that we would uh, increase our faith, increase our confidence in you, in your promises, in your presence, in your help. We pray, Father, that uh, you as our Heavenly Father, would discipline us in your providence that we might grow in our faith and in our trust and that we would trust more in you than we do in ourselves. Bless each of us who are fathers to be the kind of fathers that you want us to be. And we pray for grace and mercy and patience as we work on our character to become what you want us to be. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. There may be someone in the assembly <clears throat> this morning who needs to respond in a public way to the Lord's invitation. We want to give you that opportunity. If we may pray with you, and pray for you, uh, with regard to some matter in your life that, um, that you would like to bring before God, we would be honored to help you in that way. If you are not a Christian and yet you have reached the conclusion that you need to be obedient to God and obey the gospel, come out of the world, be added to his church, we would be honored to help you do that. And if we can study with you and help you to better understand what's involved in that, then we're happy to do that. And so we encourage you to come, whatever your need might be.